The scientific revolution starts now. My name is Adam uh, Mastriani. Uh, a lot of times people have tough with the jumble of vowels uh, that springs on them in the middle of my last name. Uh, I'm an experimental psychologist and I'm the author of Experimental History, which is a, a misnamed blog. It's about psychology and how I ended up here, I guess. Um, uh, I, I answered a Jeopardy question, right? Like not on real Jeopardy, but like in, um, in a, a, a review for a midterm. Um, in undergrad, I was taking a social psychology class. I answered one of those uh, bottom row questions, right, which is supposed to be like the harder ones. And the guy teaching the class looked at me and was like, you're pretty good at this. I was like, me? Good? good? <laughs> and, and then I thought, oh, I do work pretty hard at psychology. That must mean that I like it. And then I thought, oh, that's I'm inferring my beliefs from my behavior is that self-perception theory. And then I was like, oh, maybe I should be a psychologist. And um and I fell in love with the, the idea that we can understand uh, what goes on inside human minds between them. Um, and I haven't fallen out of love yet. Uh, but there are things that I have fallen out of love with, which are the um, structures of academia that make it difficult to answer the preceding question. Um, and so for a long time, I was mainly writing journal articles. And I always felt like something was amiss. Uh, and um, I didn't really know what. I, and I kind of... For a long time, it felt like, oh, I'm just not good enough at this. And that is the problem with it. And as I get better, it will feel better. But it didn't feel better. And then some weird friends of mine who blog anonymously under or pseudonymously under the name Slime Mold Time Mold told me, like, you should write a blog on the Internet. And I was like, nah, I shouldn't do that. And I'm like, no, you really should. And they just would not leave me alone. And then I started doing it. And I was like, oh, wait, I feel so much better when I do this. And I realized what I was doing before when I was writing journal articles was I was impersonating um, a scientist um, and I was doing an impression of what a scientist sounds like. And it's not that fun to do impressions for very long for more than a joke. Um, it's much more fun to speak as yourself. And so that's what I do on that blog. I try to continue answering the questions that got me motivated in the first place, as well as trying to answer the, the question of like, how do we, how is it still possible to do science and um and how do we open avenues um, that we've closed long ago for doing science in weird ways? Um, and how can I do some science in those weird ways too? Um, so I guess that's how I got here. Man, that's re that's a really, really interesting way of putting it. I remember showing up to grad school and I, I had also learned the science speak thing. And fortunately, we had an incredible creative writing instructor for our writing section, uh, like for, really for grant writing. But she was the first person who ever looked at my proposal, something I'd written scientifically and was like, this is garbage. Like, what are you doing? This isn't a voice, you know? And I, I was like, what? Like, I thought I was a good scientific writer. I'd written first author papers before I showed up. Mm -hmm. I was really proud of myself. And it was true. I, I was a terrible writer. I, it was very stale. I was using somebody else's language and voice. And yeah, thank God for me and Chris. Well, amen first of all. Uh, but second of all, I remember in that class, we had a several, we had several experiences where people insisted that it was not their responsibility to write in such a way that the reader could mm. understand. And that was unfathomable to me because my mindset about learning anything has been, well, the point of figuring this out is so that you can tell as many people as humanly mm. possible and have them look at it and take it apart and discuss it and debate it and make sure that people that aren't just in the field understand it, but everybody all the way down to the person who has the most casual interest understands it and can comment on it. Because mm -hmm. how will we know if we're on the right track, if it's just us in this room together that have written it, who can really evaluate it? But the sentiment in the room was very much, it's not my responsibility to do that. If they can't read it, why is that my problem? And that seems to be the <laughs> that's same. That's crazy. I, I, but it's but you you open up a Nature magazine and you know that mm -hmm. every single person who's published in there feels that way. There's no other way to explain yeah. what what goes on <laughs> in those pages. <laughs> I I I think that there there um, no one talks about this, but I but I think there's um, this like implicit belief that uh, the things that we study. I think maybe especially more in in your fields than mine. Uh, 
uh, but like the the harder the science, the more this is true. That like the things that we study are irreducibly boring, and that's <laughs> not. And we may joke about that, but actually, it's noble. Like it's noble that they are boring because only the 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 true of heart will like uh, work hard enough to understand. And and actually, we should not make it easier for people to understand because part of what makes you worthy uh, of understanding is putting in a lot of work. Um, and like, it's not our fault if you, if you don't understand, it just means you haven't passed the test yet. And, and I know no one ever, like, I think explicitly says that, but that I think is the ideology behind this feeling because otherwise, like, why wouldn't you want there to be an additional person who understands, uh, like, why wouldn't you want to be able to reach people beyond just the people who have put in as much work as you have? Um, th that part makes no sense to me Th that there would be something good about that. And I also think it comes from like, it is actually really difficult to write in a way that, that is accessible to people. It's easier to hide behind big words and jargon and doing impressions. And, and I think people feel very self-conscious about it. And so rather than accept the fact that like, this is a difficult skill that takes a long time to hone, they go like, no, it's actually a bad skill that you don't need to hone. And that's why I'm just <laughs> fine as I am. <laughs> yeah. I think there's those two forces there. There is this element of, it almost reminds me of, latin in the catholic church or something like that like i feel like mathematics and <laughs> physics can get that way too where it's just like you have to earn your place in order to understand but i, I do think there's some laziness to it too because I, I do think it's a lot easier to write poorly and just ape somebody else's voice than to actually you know say what you mean well the charitable interpretation is that it's laziness and just the fact that it's difficult and people don't want to do it. But the less charitable interpretation is that if all of the sudden your research was laid bare for anyone to understand mm. what you were doing, then maybe a lot more people would be suggesting that your research doesn't make any sense. Yeah. <laughs> and as long as you can write stuff in such a way that you can convince even a specialist audience that you're on the right track because it tastes right. They read it mm -hmm. and it tastes right. And I think an extension of this is when you read a paper and the figures don't match up with what they're describing in the text. And it's just this kind of common hallucination that everybody accepts that you read the paper and you're like, wait a second, where did they get that? And you look mm -hmm. through the text and you're like, that's really weird. That's not what the figure shows. Mm -hmm. But they boldly and calmly claim it in the text and you move on and everybody's just kind of like, okay, I mean weird i guess we can like it's very common i had this absolutely brutal immunology seminar like we had to take a diversification you know take something in a different department so i went uptown and took this immunology seminar and it was so brutal like two cell papers every week there was only 10 people sitting around a table and they just call on random people like explain this figure and you know cell papers they're just like you know 40 panels and <laughs> techniques you've never heard of i mean it it scared the you know it scared the snot out of me but <laughs> the crazy thing was that for every single cell paper people are sitting there like well you could interpret this graph very differently here like the conclusion yeah i guess you could see that but and people don't even understand for the most part that there's this whole interpretive level to science on top of just what the data says which is what you make of it and so of course if you can obscure your conclusion inside of a bunch of jargon and so forth as long as it tastes right and it flies and that becomes the headline. But at the end of the day, you know, going back to what's actually happening in the experiment can be a, a little, it can make you feel naked for sure. Well, there's just a certain amount of bluster that's associated with science that I think that people on the outside don't really get to see. Where I think that there is a very firm narrative structure that is enforced by the people who are doing the writing. And this is true, I think, in psychology and mm -hmm. the social sciences, because we all know that this is kind of the source of the replication crisis. And, or not the source, but the, the, the first <sighs> stirrings of awareness that something was maybe amiss mm -hmm. in the sciences. Which I, I think that it's the case in cancer research, it's the case in, in all of the hard sciences as well. It's just, it's easiest to kick the social sciences because the claims are so easy to understand. And yeah. so you can take apart a power pose paper and you can understand why it's nonsensical, but you can't take apart a physics paper in the same way because the, the mm -hmm. bar to entry is higher. But there's something weird that happens as you enter into the progressively more and more difficult arenas, I think that people inherently have a bias towards supporting 
the status quo. Do you know what do you know what I mean by that? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I think the 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 less accessible the science is, the more it kind of feels like I just need to defer to whatever the experts say. Um uh I saw the the uh Oppenheimer recently and like the way that they depict like the genius of Oppenheimer is like he's got like flashes of electrons in his head. Like, how could we possibly understand the mind of this man? And like he do, does seem like he was a very smart person, but he is working on a technology that obviously like ended many lives and and changed every single life on earth. Like we do both have a responsibility to understand what is going on and and he and the people working with him also have a responsibility to explain uh what they're doing. Um but there and I don't know everybody in the movie does it. It's just like Oppenheimer you're so smart to like how can I even talk to you? Uh yeah, we, which I, I think is a shame because people take advantage of it. There's mm. so much myth making in science too. Like I don't think people understand if you actually read the letters between people as they're being declassified now about this. Like there was so much trial and error going on. It wasn't just like some genius person like, all right, here's how the bomb works. Let's do it. It was like, well, I'll try this, try that, try this, try that. Okay, throw that out. Make this bigger. Make this smaller. Mm -hmm. It was like very much just in many senses, the same way that our ancestors constructed the first bow and arrow. They're just throwing shit at the wall, seeing what sticks, and and working with it, parameterizing it. Yeah, they parameterize it mathematically, and it's sophisticated, but it's not this, like, you know, act of God that leads to these things. It's It's really this iterative process with huge teams of people grinding away in these experimental laboratories, making it happen. And it's like when the end result is an atom bomb, it's hard to argue with, right? Because it doesn't matter how abstrusely the paper is written or how complicated the math is. You have a bomb. You drop it. Mm -hmm. It kills people. End of story. But when you have stuff that's theoretical and when you have stuff that is almost philosophical about the nature of the human mind or the nature of light or the nature of gravity and space time and all of these things you are left with the fact that we're telling stories about data points. And those stories are then evaluated by a committee of people who are your peers who will tell you whether or not the story that you have chosen to tell about your data points is kosher. And that's a strange corruption in the sciences, I think, that people really seem to trust you I, you cannot imagine how many people we come across who are like well peer review is the saving grace of science that's how we know that <laughs> things work and it's always really difficult to know if you should say something to them or not because it's <laughs> wait peer review doesn't work <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> wait, somebody needs to explain this to me yeah but seriously yeah what what is, what is the problem with peer review exactly i mean yeah. it seems obvious but i think we should just like lay out the fundamentals here of of the critique because it sounds very very reasonable you have an yeah. idea you put it in front of your peers your peers are these noble people who evaluate it and tell you that you know this is how you could make your idea better but in general go forth and prosper young scientist but that doesn't seem to be the way that it works and you wrote a really really i don't want to say scathing i think you wrote a really measured takedown of the system yeah, some people found it scathing from the way that they yelled at me, but um, <laughs> but I didn't intend it to be because uh, it seems so reasonable to me. Because I agree, it 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 sounds so reasonable when you describe it like that. And what, I think what a lot of people don't understand is like it it doesn't in practice work like that. And so the the way that I wrote the piece was um, for most things in, in science. I mean, especially in psychology, where we're always running interventions, we think of interventions as interventions. We think of the the way that we intrude into people's lives as changes that are worthy of study to see, did we make people better off when we made that change? Um, and peer review was an intervention where we never really stopped to ask, did we make uh, ourselves better off by doing this? I think because it seemed like it was so obvious that this was going to work. And no one really decided that we were gonna do this. It was a bunch of individuals making uh, decisions based on their own incentives. Um, but historically, this system is very weird that um, in like the prehistory of science, obviously, there was no one standing there telling Galen that, uh, you know, he couldn't publish his theory of bodily humors. Uh, it was basically like, do you have the ability to write something and transmit it to someone else? Like now you've published. 
Hey guys, we need your help. In order to keep the lights on, in order to grow this into a more powerful project, we really need you to consider giving just a few dollars a month over at patreon.com. We also have a budding community there that is really special. It's really the highlight of my week to meet with you guys, with our patrons, and hang out and figure out where the interesting topics are at. Where are the investigations that we should be chasing down? If you don't have any money right now, maybe you can just share it with somebody. This podcast grows by word of mouth. And as it grows, we're able to get better and better guests. So it's really, really important that you share it with someone. Come over to Discord. Tell us your ideas. We have a Facebook page. Or you can just leave a comment down below. Also, consider coming out to our conference next year, which is going to be April 6th and 7th in Austin, Texas, to align with the clips which is passing through there on the Monday thereafter. So hopefully we'll see you there. We'll get your ideas. And back to the conversation. And it was a real hodgepodge for a long time. Like people had magazines, like the, basically the equivalent of magazines and newspapers and, and proceedings of scientific societies. And then early journals that work very differently, that sometimes don't even have enough articles to fill. And so the, the peer review is just the editor knows you and is going to publish whatever you write because you were friends. It's only in uh, sometime in the 1960s that this system becomes universal, that the way that you do your work as a scientist is you send it to a journal who then sends it to other people, usually anonymous, who then read it supposedly, and then send back comments. And based on those comments, that editor decides whether this paper is published or not. And and I think what people also don't understand, even if they've heard about publish or perish, what, what they don't know is like that everything hinges on them saying yes to this. Like you cannot continue on to the next stage of your career unless you get enough people to say yes enough times. Um, and so that, I think, is the really damaging part of the system, that it uh, it corrupts the thoughts that you can have in the first place, because downstream, eventually, these thoughts have to be put in such a way that some anonymous strangers will say, yes, transmit these thoughts to other people. Um, and so you could also ask, like, did peer review actually accomplish the goals that it set out to accomplish, like catching fraud and bad papers? And the answer is, I mean, largely no, because you could see the papers that they are very bad when we catch fraud. It's almost never because a peer reviewer speaks up and goes, I think this paper is fraudulent. Usually the story of fraud begins with a paper being published. Um, and then sometimes a decade later, uh, people calling it into question. And they've actually run studies where you know they deliberately insert errors into papers and send them to reviewers and see how many they catch. And they catch about a quarter of them. Um, and so people often say, well, a quarter, that's, sound, that's 25% is more than zero. Like, isn't that good? And I think it's, it's actually maybe worse than, than having no system at all because it, uh, it asks for your credibility without doing the work necessary to, to earn your credibility. So a lot of people think, uh, especially I, I find journalists think this, that like if something has been peer reviewed, then it's trustworthy. Um, and in fact, like really what people have done is like, maybe skim it. They almost certainly have not looked at the data, which is if there's any malfeasance or something wrong is probably where that exists. Um, and so uh, in, in, in the piece, I liken this a little bit to like the uh, the FDA, like sniffing the, your ground beef and going, I don't know, it smells fine. Like it's, I'm sure you can eat it. <laughs> and like, that's kind of worse than them saying like, we make no guarantees that this will not kill you. Uh, like act accordingly. Because if they did, I'd be like, I'm not buying it if I'm going to die. But, it, but if they claim that they've checked it and they haven't, then maybe I eat it and die uh, because I trusted them. Um, What's really fascinating is you would think that it would have been total chaos in the early days of science, like just people publishing tons of bullshit everywhere. But it's interesting because it puts the responsibility on the author to make sure that everybody can reproduce their findings, right? Like no one's going to care about your letter unless they try it out and they're like, oh my goodness, like, yeah, this new diffraction behavior that this guy in Italy observed seems to check out. I can see that happening. I want to figure out what the next step in this process is. And so I don't think that it was just this utter mayhem because there weren't police officers making sure that people weren't lying. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a great point because if it were the case that peer review were such a, a powerful and positive intervention, you should see on whatever like measure of science you have, you see like this line goes like, e, and then you, you hit peer review and it goes, Broop, like, because it's so universal, it takes so much time and effort. Um, and intervention like that, that, we expect to have very visible um, effects. And like by any measures, we're, we are, if anything, doing worse than we were before. Um, and I think the reason why it was fine that people could publish whatever um, is what I argue in a different piece of, about strong, science being a strong link problem that like really only our best work matters. Uh, and like all the garbage that we publish 
Um, like it can distract us. It can eat up resources. Neither of those things are good, but in the long run, it doesn't live like strong ideas live because they're useful. Like the diffraction method uh, sticks around if it's better at doing the thing that we wanted to do in the first place. If it doesn't, it wastes our time for a little bit and then it goes away. And it's it's like this was a huge thing for me to get over when it came. Like I, I also do music and art. And when I was younger, I would be really afraid to publish anything. Like I was like, ah, oh, it's not as good as, you know, the people <laughs> that I'm looking up to. And I realized at some point when I started to really dig into the back catalog of some of my favorite artists that they had like tons of records that were terrible. And they were putting <laughs> like they, that was part of the process was just moving forward, making stuff, getting it out there. Because like you, what you just said absolutely applies in the arts too. Nobody remembers the garbage. They just move mm -hmm. on. They're like, yeah, it was a bad record. What's next? And as soon as there's yeah. something incredible, that's what people latch onto. That's what makes the playlist. That's what's on the radio. It's like nobody cares about all of the the steps along the way, essentially. But we've we've had a shift in the way that science is done. Like I remember I was writing a piece about the early days of discovering the link between light and electricity. And so in order to figure that out, I had to dig into the texts that were describing the intellectual foment of the time. And it was literally people making vacuum tubes and rubbing them with things. You know, it was, they were, it, certainly they were devices and certainly they were experiments and they were difficult methods to reproduce. But once you had the method, it was relatively inexpensive for everybody to do it. Like there was one fantastic anecdote from the, from the book uh, about, he was about Samuel Gray, who was one of the first experimenters. And he was living in this chapter house where he was basically a subsidized pensioner by one of the universities. And he was living there with a bunch of other old guys that had nothing to do and enough money that they could do some stuff. And so they just started hanging stuff by strings from the ceiling and seeing what the longest chain of stuff you could have that would actually carry the the motive force that would allow you to pick some pick up some chaff on the other side and they figured out they had to use silk strings instead of wool strings they figured out that if they hung they had some little boy that was hanging around them so they hung him up <laughs> and used him in the experiment and we're like okay so if you touch the static the the charged rod to his foot the chaff flies to his face and you can put him into the chain and they're just they're just fucking around they're just having a good time and you can't really do that anymore it feels like what you need is you need a laboratory you need a sequencing machine you need access to a population of undergraduates you need to be able to you have need a government funded topic you need a government <laughs> that's what i'm saying like in order to achieve the next step of discovery cuz my background's biology the amount of resources that you need to run a single biological experiment from test tubes to reagents to kits to machines is fifty to $100,000. And so it's really hard to imagine somebody being able to just walk in off the street without government funding to set up a pipeline for being able to do that kind of work because it's so specific and difficult. And I think that the rise of peer review is intimately funded or intimately tied to the rise of government funding because you have to be able to have some kind of diffuse way of saying this work is good enough to get lots of money. And that mm -hmm. seems to be the driving motivation behind it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, the, the term peer review starts as a, a way of, of describing what we do with grant applications that we need some way of knowing uh, whether we should give money over here and over there. And like a totally reasonable answer to that question is, well, let's convene a board of experts and have them read the proposals and vote. It seems like there would be nothing wrong with that, except, well, what's going to succeed when the team of experts get together and vote and which like the, in a first pass the post system, it's going to be something where, where like, well, no one vetoed it. Um, like we're already sure enough that it's going to work that um, that there's kind of almost no reason to do it in the first place. And like, I think this is a reasonable way of funding some research, like some research like that needs to get done. And what I think no one uh, has the courage to do is to say some things cannot be evaluated beforehand. Like we have to be willing to say to write off some of the money that we spend um, as it's going nowhere, but only in the process of being OK with going nowhere. Are we going to end up going somewhere? Like we have to fund some people screwing around. 
if what we're funding is everyone who's very good at, at checking the boxes and producing the papers, there's only a certain kind of research that's going to get done. And sometimes there's zero value in it, but we're missing a whole part uh, of the scientific process by like incentivizing people to to basically be optimizers for uh, for receiving funding and turning funding into papers. Um, and no one e exactly tells you this, like you you pick up these norms pretty easily, right? That like, you're not allowed to write a paper where you're like, well, I screwed around and, and found this. Um, and no one told me that, but I know that because I've never read a paper like that that's, that is more recent than like 1978. Uh, and I know that like when I uh, submitted my first first author paper, uh, one of the comments I got back was like, it's a little too fun. Um, and like, it, it, and it wasn't even like there were like jokes in it exactly. It was like some of the examples were a little too jaunty. Like it seemed like we were, uh, like having a bit too much fun. <laughs> I thought this person is my enemy. Like the idea that a paper should not be fun, but it's a, it has a chilling effect. Right. So I, I now know, like if I want to publish papers, which if I want to succeed, I have to, then I have to make sure to not irritate this kind of person. Um, and if I want to get funding, they're also going to be on the funding board eventually, right? So I have to make sure that the things that I do are legible to these people. And just not every good idea is going to be legible. And it's like, it's weird, right? Because on one hand, oh, did you want to say something? I'll get to it. On one hand, it has expanded access to science in the sense of who can carry the mantle of scientist. Because back in the day, before you had the funding, before you had the system, it was independently wealthy people or the gifted autists or the super nerds. And this was this collection of people that were anointed as being the ones who were capable of being scientists. And everybody else was just kind of, well, you're not going to be a scientist. Why would you be a scientist? And I feel like we've had this very, very strong push into the sciences that we, we spent a bunch of time talking about this yesterday, which is coupled to a push towards the production of technology. And so we've confused science, which is this playful thing of, well, let's just screw around and see what comes out of it with engineering and technology, which is we have a goal in mind and we are racing towards that goal because we need to have room temperature superconductors to make the rail guns that will allow us to defeat the nuclear missiles that come from Russia when World War III breaks out. And so there's a completely different tenor in the way that science is treated in society where it has become part of the war machine and it has become part of the economic machine and it has become part of the advising machine. And so it is folded into all of the different ways that the government and the state is run because the government's like, well, we need to have evidence-based mechanisms for evaluating that our policies are good and right and will do what we need them to do. And so science was happily folded into that. But once you do that, you also need to have a much larger body of people who are doing that work because you need more data. And there's this machine that keeps wanting to be fed. And so what you do is you basically expand it and you're like, OK, we don't have enough of a supply of nerds. We need more nerds. We're going to open up the floodgates. We're going to have more money. We're going to train people to become nerds and do the science. And that's going to be really effective. And so now you have a, an explosion of people that are scientists and engineers, but none of them are really scientists in the classical sense of just, you know, the the vicar in the abbey in England who has the greatest collection of spiders that the Western Hemisphere has ever seen. Yeah. Uh, man, I never want to go in the spider room. Um, <laughs> the, uh, yeah, I, I think there, there's this idea that, that like, um, uh, that you can do science at spear point, that, like, it, you can put, you can, uh, like, point um you're all of your nerds in the right direction and go like achieve these goals that are useful to the state um and it's not that you totally can't do that i mean the manhattan project is is a great example of a time when that does happen um but that project was built on a bunch of people screwing around for a long time without all that much scrutiny on what they were doing and that's the only reason why there was a, this like bedrock uh, of theory out of which they could produce something useful and so if what you want uh, it are like these legible outcomes that are useful to the state that you can show how like we increased GDP this much because of this grant that we made, you're, you're again going to cut off um, uh, everything in the long term where we're like, yes, it, you are not going to have this a big payoff 
in the next uh, billing cycle from allowing this person to screw around. But you may have a huge payoff in the next lifetime. Um, and like when that next lifetime comes, we're going to pay the price for not allowing people the the freedom to screw around. And, and it's also not that every person who screws around is going to produce something useful. A lot of them won't. Um, and like this too, I think, cannot be optimized. Like that's the whole point. Like that's how we got back to the point where we want everything to be legible. We're like, of all these nerds screwing around, we need to figure out which ones are going to be productive. Uh, and so to do that, we need to stop them from screwing around. We need them to apply for grants uh, and make it clear how what they're doing is going to pay off. Um, and then we destroy the thing that, that produced the thing that we wanted in the first place. It's a little bit like trying really hard to be happy. Like it, you don't, you can't do that. It doesn't work. Like you have to find some kind of other way. Like you basically have to not pay attention to it uh, and then you feel fine. Uh, but trying, this is a, a, a problem that like, has this wicked feature of uh, if you try to optimize, it does exactly the thing that you don't want it to do. Mm, it's like fixation on the outcome as opposed to what, how you get there. Yeah, I always, I'm always like kind of confused when I see these like self help programs that are like, you need to learn to love yourself. And I'm like, what if you're an asshole? <laughs> like, what if, <laughs> you know, what if the reason you don't like yourself is actually valid? It just seems like you're looking at the wrong end of the pipe. But I wanted to ask you, um, if you have any insight into how this came about specifically uh, down the Epstein route and particularly Robert Maxwell and the initiation of the this management class of journals that was going to be private and sold to all the universities and this subscription service and this massive industry that blossomed right around the time of this peer review pipeline and seem to introduce this strange oligarchy into the, insert that into the scientific pipeline. Do you think that this, like, was the peer review structure fundamentally an industrially motivated bureaucracy? That, that's a great question. And, and I'll admit, I don't know all that much about the history of the business side of it. Like, how did these come to make so much money? Because a lot of uh, the, the oldest journals weren't started by people who were, um, it's seemingly primarily d driven by profit, right? Like nature being one of these, the, like it's, it's run by this guy who's kind of a dilettante. Um, he kind of just likes hearing about a lot of the stuff going on. Um, so he puts himself at the center of it by being good at soliciting articles and disseminating them quickly. It's only later that people figure out how to make a lot of money doing this. Um, I, this is another thing I think, uh, I mean, scientists understand very well, but, but uh, a lot of other people don't, which is how much money is going on here in a way that makes no sense that like if you came to uh to me with a startup that's like i'm gonna make every scientist like pay to have me publish their paper and then i'll make other paper the other people pay me to read it and also the money's gonna come from the government i would go like this is the <laughs> stupidest startup of all time this will never work and for some reason this works um this is how what i understand and it it was largely an invention of this one dude robert maxwell who, who had tried on a bunch of different things. And the guy had like 19 names before he was like 20 years. Like, he's a very strange character. He was involved in all sorts of different intelligence operations during the war. And he came out and decided that exactly what you just said, it would be a really smart idea to essentially aggregate uh, art scientific articles and sell them subscriptions back to the school. And each school would have a library and he would essentially have He'd be sitting at the top of this and essentially be able to tax people on the way in and on the way out eventually. It's just Do you know a, if it was like a reputational thing? Like, did he fight, figure out a way to market it as being a desirable place to publish? I think he just realized that like universities didn't have all of the journals on hand and that if he could make sure that they were, had a, each, each university had a library and he would help them stock their library regularly, right? By selling them subscriptions to all of these magazines then he could set up a circuit, essentially. Interesting. Which would, you know, presumably benefit the universe. They think it's attractive because they get all of the latest cutting-edge research and they pay some money and they can raise more money. And it's a great deal for him. And then I'm not sure at what point the journals became, you know, very lucrative on their own right in the middle of all that. But I know it all happened right around the same time after the war, 1960s. And I just, I think so many of the crises in our modern civilization are like, come down to, you know, the old cliche, like the road to hell is paved in good intentions. It's like, then people think about 
the first order effects are like, oh, this will work really good right now. But they're not thinking like 10, 20, like they're not thinking second, third order effects 10, 20 years later. How is this actually going to play out? They're just like, oh, it seems like a good idea right now. And so yeah. I wonder how much of the peer review was like that, too. Yeah, that's really interesting. I didn't know the story of that guy. I'll have to read more about it. Yeah, check it out. Um, check it out. It's fascinating. Yeah. Uh, and certainly, like, a, a force that is uh, that helps that happen is um, the increasing scarcity of opportunities, at least opportunities for per capita in science, that, that like, when, um, when there's not that many uh, PhDs being produced and there's plenty of jobs for them to have, um, you don't need to have as many markers or, or like legible markers that are legible at a distance of how good you are, because your field is small enough that like the people hiring you probably know you or know people that, you know, um, there are enough articles that or there aren't too many articles that like they can't read at least a good portion of them. But when all that goes away, when now the person applying is a stranger to the person doing the hiring, you have to know like, OK, well, how good are they? Um and a key marker of that is, well, they published in these journals that, that we believe to be good. Um, and like we don't exactly need that system when in a, in a world where people know each other better and it's smaller and we can all manage our reputations interpersonally. Like now we need a middleman to manage our reputations for us. Uh, and that makes those journals so much more valuable um, because now they are signifiers of status and therefore useful for hierarchy in a way that like, uh, the, that makes it so that you don't have to read the paper, basically. Everyone at every point wants someone else to do their homework for them. Mm. Uh, and like no one at any point is actually doing the homework, but a lot of people make money on the appearance of doing the homework. Uh, this makes me wonder if there really is enough capacity in our society for the number of PhDs that we produce. Right, because I think about, you know, our graduating class was probably 20 people, but that was one department in one university, and they were all probably about that size. Some were bigger, some were smaller, but let's say that there's 15 departments that are graduating 10 students a year at one university. Multiply that by the number of universities in the country. And I just sometimes look at it and I wonder if it makes sense because most people are government funded, right? So everybody, people are getting NSF grants or they're getting NIH grants or they're under their PIs or R01 grant or something like that. But the money's being filtered from the government. It's paying the overhead of the universities, right? Because every grant that the university gets, they take 50% of, which I think most people mm -hmm. also don't know about. And mm -hmm. so that's why research universities are so wealthy, not because of just reputational heft and the fact that they charge $60,000 a year for undergraduate tuition, it's literally that they're taking, they're making money hand over fist from grants. And I just... Which essentially goes into their endowment and acts as a sort of hedge fund for their various investments. I, I personally think that it probably just goes to administrators at this point, but <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's options. But I just, I wonder if there's any way back from where we are right now, because there's so many people that are graduating with PhDs, there's a limited number of positions and it seems like we need all the shortcuts in order to be able to make that system work. And so for me, the next question is, okay, well, do we need this many PhDs? And mm. I don't, I don't know. I go back and forth. I really do. Yeah. Cause I mean, everyone has to confront this problem where each professor over the course of their career is going to train, I don't know, somewhere between 15 and 30 students, de depending on the field and, the, and their own success and funding, but many, many multiples of the people who like of their of replacement rate. Um, right. So like eventually they will die and someone will take their job, but they trained all of these people who uh, have to go somewhere else. It can't expand indefinitely. Like we had a period of time where the expansion of academia was covering up this problem. Um, but something has to happen for all these people. Um, the, the reason why, uh, to your point, they're so fun in the first place is like the professor who's getting the grant needs somebody to do the actual work because they're very busy getting the grants. Um, <laughs> and so they don't actually, they're not uh, incentivized really to train replacements. They're incentivized to have labor. Um, and like one way that labor kind of gets laundered is like, I can pay you not that much money because you are actually doing an educational or get, you're getting an educational experience. And so really, I just have to keep you alive. Like, it's fine to pay you $25,000 a year. 
um, because you are being set up for the opportunity to make significantly more money than that. Um, but each individual, actually, that, that's not going to happen for them, at least in academia. They will have other opportunities elsewhere. Those opportunities will always be like sort of a weird muddle, uh, right? Like they'll they'll figure out for themselves, like they won't have been trained to do the things that they end up doing. And most of the places they, they go uh, will value them in part because they have the signifier that they're really smart. And, and I think in narrower cases that like, oh, you can do computational stuff and we do that. And then that's why we, uh, we hire you. Like, I don't know what would change this equilibrium other than like a collapse in funding for science um, that makes it impossible to attract so many people. Um, or I think the appearance of like better alternatives. Like if you are a, a driven young person, you like like school, you like answering questions, you do a little research, you like that, you want to, you know, you want to figure out how the universe works. What do you do? Um, like the dominant option is go to graduate school. Um, and uh, and I wish there were another option as, as well, one one that uh, uh, that maybe had its own pros and cons. But that that's a, a, a long term dream of mine. What does that look like? I would love uh, if, if I had a had a big chunk of money right now, I would uh, buy a house um, probably in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and um, and I would invite people who uh, young folks who I already know are like trying to do research. Um, in their own various ways and their own limitations uh invite them to like live in the house and basically like you get to be kind of the equivalent of a phd student like you live together i don't live in the house i live in a different house they can have the house um and uh and it's like a lab and like you get trained to do to do research there's no expectation that you publish in journals i mean you could i find kind of weird uh but like you do research and you put it on the internet um and at the end of your time there like you and you go on to do the things that now you are able to do because you have that ability and you also have a, a repertoire of of work that shows what your capabilities um, that like I think it wouldn't be that hard to do better than uh, the equivalent in academia be because of all the forces that we've just talked about. Uh, and I think it would be good at holding academia to account um, that like these randos in this house uh, are able um, to produce work that's like way more useful and interesting than the very expensive labs that we have trying to do the same thing uh, at much greater cost. There's a lot easier in psychology where my overhead for research is so much smaller. Like basically my only cost is paying participants. Like I don't need Petri dishes or PCR machines. Um, but uh, but yeah, that, that would be my dream. And I, I'm so glad to hear that because that, that's kind of the end game of, of this project that we've <laughs> got going here, right? It's like, yeah, we have a podcast and YouTube channel and stuff right now. And, you know, it's as soon as that is able to actually pay for itself, we're definitely going to start putting it into some sort of nonprofit where we can grow something like that. And I think an actual yeah. space is like our serious long-term dream that we've been thinking. And I honestly think that if a lot of people do that, it could be kind of beautiful. You could imagine these, you know, institutional decay is a real, real thing. And so, yeah, a lot of these structures are getting top heavy. They're not really coming out with groundbreaking research like they used to. And I think that, you know, with with the abundance uh, free capital, right, there's a lot of people with a lot, there's a few people with a lot of money. And I think they <laughs> a lot of them genuinely want to do something useful with their money. And they're kind of looking at these old crumbling institutions like, I don't really just want to dump my money into this anymore. And so I think that the future does hold some promise for these extra academic institutions really becoming a force. And um, I hope to contribute to it personally. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I also think about it in context of ideas on the internet where I, uh, they, there was, we were in California and we were sitting on this hillside and it was spring and we were surrounded by California poppies. And we were like, I wonder what the alkaloid profile of these poppies is. And so you type it into Google and you get a bunch of things about how opium is bad for you, like a DEA website. Um, there's like maybe one or two very, very dry science papers that are towards the bottom of the page. And it really struck me because it was right around the time that GPT-3 was coming out and everybody was freaking out about, my God, what is going to happen to search? And I was thinking about it and realized that if tech companies that were internet focused were really smart about this, what they would do is they would find ways to 
disperse funding to people that were capable of making really phenomenal pieces of writing for the internet. Because the crisis of the internet right now is the fact that it's kind of mostly filled with SEO-optimized garbage. You type a question into Google, and you just get trash. You get like five instances of the same trash, too. And it's like, just, none of the web pages are real. Like five instances of the same trash. It's bad. It's, we've gone from the promise of the internet being able to give you anything that you want and Google being filled with really useful things to just garbage. That's obviously a problem for tech companies, but I don't see there being any programs that would support this sort of creative I don't want to call it blogging because blogging to me is like, I went to Italy. These are my vacation photos. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and that's not, that's not what we're after. We're after creating kind of this body of literature that's fun to read and smart. And I think that Slime Mold, Time Mold, Slate Star Codex, um, Eric Hole's blog, like there's a collection of things and experimental yeah. history too, right? These are all places where smart people who think about the world in a very specific and inquisitive way put their ideas down. But they're all scattered and they're they're funded scattershot, right? You put it on Substack yeah. or something. and sub, I mean, Substack is maybe the closest thing. But Substack doesn't have the kind of bottom line that Google does. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think this is a really good point because I think uh, people look at, look at the internet and they look at science and they go, oh, it's all, it's too much. Like, how could we ever... There's too much of it. And what people understand is like, actually, there there is a, a dearth, like a an aching lack of the best stuff. Um, and uh, I used to encounter this problem all the time going to conferences. I go like, ah, oh, there's too much of all this bad stuff. And, and I go, all that really matters is, is there enough good stuff to fill my day? Um, and like, am I able to find that? Like, those are the only questions. And beyond that, it does not matter how many additional talks there are that are bad. Uh, I mean, like in the broad sense, like, okay, they, they soak up resources, whatever. I have to walk further down the hall to get past them to get to the talk that I want to go to. But like, it, where is the good stuff? Um, and, and I think people don't get that I, either from the funding angle that, that like doing the best work is really time intensive um, and like very difficult and only a few people are ready to do it. Um, and so uh, really want to identify those people and try to uh, like try to help them. Um, and the fact that there is so much bad stuff, like kind of doesn't matter. Um, so long as we can find the good stuff. I mean, th this is again, like the idea of this being a strong link problem, um, that like, I, I don't care how many additional pages there are of the Google results that are not relevant. I need to know that the good thing comes at the top and I need there to be a good thing to come at the top in the first place. Um, and beyond that, like the rest can all be scams. It's okay. Can you, can you uh, just explain the strong link? For what that means yeah yeah uh yeah th this is the the um so some problems have uh this this property of being weak link where the the worst thing is what matters um so like anything related to safety is is often this way so like food safety is a weak link problem it doesn't matter if uh um how safe the safest food is in the grocery store if there's something in there that's going to kill me like we have we have failed the to solve the problem of food safety um uh, so problem, some problems have that property and other problems are strongly problems where it doesn't actually matter how bad the worst thing is. What matters is how good the best thing is. Mm. Um, and so like an Olympic team is, uh, or the Olympics is a strongly problem, right? It doesn't, it doesn't matter your 30th percentile wrestler, uh, because they're never going to compete in the first place. You want to make your best, co uh, competitor better. Um, you don't get anything from making your mediocre competitor into a, a slightly better competitor. Um, and what I argue in this piece is, is science has this property of being a strong link problem. Um, that like the bad stuff can distract you, it can uh, soak up resources, but in the long run, it is the good stuff that matters. It's our ability to produce the best work. Um, like one example of this being like Newton obviously invented mechanics, pretty good, still using that. He also came up with, with a recipe for the Philosopher's Stone. Didn't go anywhere. Uh, at the time, maybe some people wasted their time and resources trying to make a Philosopher's Stone. I think he actually like wrote it in code so that no one could you know take its power or whatever. Um, but uh, you know we're not still fumbling over ourselves trying to make Philosopher's Stones. The good stuff sticks around because it's useful. People continue to use it. That's what keeps it alive. Um, and this is why uh, I, I think if you don't believe in this, I think this makes it difficult to accept something like 
we're going to take big risks in what we fund, knowing that some is going to go nowhere. And that doesn't matter. All that matters is the best stuff that we created. Did it go somewhere? Um, because that is what hoists the rest of us up. Yeah. I mean, I like that it's less fearful, too. It's less like, oh, no, there's bad stuff. We have to go and attack it. It's like, just like, don't. No, you don't. It's just, just ignore it. That's, you know, it's, and it's a good philosophy for life, too, right? There's always going to be people just like, you know, polluting whatever social environment with their bad attitudes or, you know, whatever it is, bad data or anything. And it's just like, just ignore those people. Like, you don't have to let them into your, your, the constructs that you're making of the world. You don't have to build your models upon their models. It's really interesting. Yeah. And it's really hard for people to do yeah. it, it feels achingly wrong that there should be wrong things in the world. Mm. Um, but like you, you can waste your life trying to stamp them out and actually not produce anything useful. Um, that like, if you took the bottom 10% of papers and deleted them from the world, we would not be much better off. No one was reading those papers in the first place. Um, if you took, but if we could add another 10% of the best at the top, like our world will look totally different. Um, and so, uh, and so I, I get like why that bottom percent is so enraging because it is so bad. Uh, but it, but it takes, I think it, yeah, it takes a lot of courage to go like, I'm not going to look at the, at that stuff. I'm going to like, uh, aspire to produce the best stuff or create a world in which the best stuff can be produced. It's very stoic. I like it. It's, it's very, uh, <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. I've been I've been going back and reading meditations again, Marcus Aurelius, and you know, there's so many times where he he talks about this too. He's like, "Well, look, you're gonna encounter bad people because there can't be ba good people without bad people. So just accept that that's part of the universe, and accept that they're playing their part in this whole nature, and just you know, don't pay don't pay it any mind. Don't integrate it into who you are and what you're doing. It's like." It's really freeing when you realize you can do that, but it's also very yeah. counterintuitive too, because yeah, there's just yeah. something inside everybody that wants justice. Like we want things to be right. <laughs> well, yeah. when it comes to science, people want things to be right, but they also want things that they can rely on. They want the structure of science to be something that they can trust and they can use for policy. They need it to be useful, which is kind of what you've been talking about. And so... I think that that's a difficulty because evaluating whether or not something is good or useful in terms of the kind of scientism way in which we apply it is not easy. Mm -hmm. In fact, I think that it might be one of the hardest things in the world, right? Because you have a paper that looks fantastic and They've figured out how to take stem cells and differentiate them into any tissue of the body. And it's incredible and it's super useful and it's going to change the world. Or they have a room temperature superconductor and it's the future of science and or technology. And it's a really difficult task of figuring out what the hell is wrong with that work in order to be able to make a decision about what to do with it. And yeah. in those cases, the really big blockbuster things. And so a lot of attention is turned to them. And very, very quickly, we get to the point that, okay, this probably isn't that useful. But I feel like there's an entire field of things that are slightly less impactful, but also useful that are very difficult to sift through. And we don't have any algorithms. We don't have any shortcuts. We don't have any heuristics. Uh, most people... Most people's statistics in papers, I think, make it almost impossible to evaluate if what they've done is legitimate or not, because the transformations that they do to the data are so obscure that you would have to be, you know, basically Elizabeth Bick full time going through and evaluating if it works mm -hmm. or not in order to be able to actually tell. And so I think that that's why people obsess with getting rid of the bottom 10 percent of science, because we live in an era where any time that somebody says something that is a true fact about the world. What do they do? They pull a study. Mm -hmm. Look, this study shows this. And if the study shows this, it must be so. <laughs> and so if that still exists in the world, that means that somebody can go to that study, point to it, and make a totally fallacious conclusion. And that's a difficulty 
that I don't see going away. Yeah, it really broke my heart. I, I was quite late. I feel like I lived in a very naive world for many years, even working in research, before I came to the conclusion that a study could essentially show either side of any particular argument. Like, there was a way to ask the questions in a way, to design the experiments in a way that you could present the completely opposite perspective. And it didn't even have to be, like, fake data or anything. It's literally just in the way you design and the questions you ask and the actors you point to. You can tell a very different story. And honestly, like, it kind of freaked me out for a couple of years. I was just like, oh, my God, we know nothing. <laughs> we know nothing. <laughs> but I, I've kind of walked back on that lately because I find that the more that you're able to actually interpret it yourself, the, the further you can get and not really taking people's conclusions on their face. But yeah. It's so hard though, right? Because the skeptic, the ultimate skeptic basically says that any output of a research program has a high likelihood of being bullshit. Because exactly what Shiloh's saying, you can go and you can run the experiment in a slightly different way and get completely different data and come out the other side with something completely different. You think you have a mitochondria, but in reality it's something completely different and your assays for the last 50 years have some kind of fundamental mismatch in what you're doing versus what you're actually measuring. And so you've come up with a completely nonsensical model of reality. It's all bullshit. We're no closer than Galen's humors to actually understanding any of nature. And there's things that you get to where you really do start to think that that's the case. Like we were talking to this biochemist who studies the origin of life. And the the like at the heart of every cell, there's this metabolic process, which is uh, responsible for ATP synthesis. So you have your mitochondria. The mitochondria create a proton gradient inside the the inner membrane. And those protons fall through this thing called the ATP synthase. And the ATP synthase turns like a ratchet and the ca ratchet chemically attaches a phosphate group to this depleted molecule. And so you have this currency that can travel around through the cell and catalyze reactions. Okay. Great. Uh, there is not a one-to-one -one relationship between protons and the production of ATP, and that model is wrong. And that is not... No one knows. No one knows why. Nobody knows what is actually going on. Nobody can explain why it's wrong. And so there's just this fundamental gap in our understanding that a skeptic can point to and be like, are we any closer than we ever were to actually understanding anything? Or is it just all kind of masturbatory fun that's just going to fade with the wind and we'll have cell phones and neural implants at the end of it, but we'll be no closer to understanding the relationship between light and gravity than we ever were? I think the, the optimistic take on that is there's still so much exciting work left to do. Um, because there are many people who feel, I think, especially toward the beginning of doing a PhD, that like all the easy stuff has been taken, like there's nothing left. Um, and like, no, it's pretty much all left. Um, like what obscures that is there's been a lot done. Um, but like a lot of that what's done was wrong or didn't matter. Um, and so, yeah, uh, like th there was no injustice done to us because we happened to be born at a certain time. Like we could have been born a thousand years earlier and known somewhat less we could have been born a thousand years later and knows no somewhat more but wherever we like happen to enter the game there's still so much game left to play and like that's that's why i'm in it um and so like yeah i, I also teeter back and forth between like the sheer fear of feeling like we know nothing like how can we even begin to to like answer these questions and the excitement of how can we begin to answer these questions <laughs> um yeah one of the places i encounter it the most is if you ever have any kind of like, I don't know, if, if you're trying to like adjust your diet, for instance, right? You can go and find an entire universe of literature that will tell you whatever, any particular food element is the devil and an entire universe that says that is the key to health. And they're all substantiated by all of these studies. And you're just like, what is going on? What should I be eating? I don't know. I think that that actually reflects maybe what the problems are with social sciences too, which is that the human is a complete and utter mystery because it's not just the material body of the human that you have to deal with. You have the unpleasant realization that mental processes appear to have a significant impact on the body. 
And so instead of just dealing with a, an object, you're dealing with the ship of Theseus that rebuilds itself as you're studying it. And good luck pinning it down hard enough, fast enough to be able to say anything at all. And I think the dietary studies really are the epitome of that because it's very, very hard to construct a study that actually controls for all of the different ways in which people live and eat. And then you throw in women's monthly cycles and you're mm-hmm. basically just screwed. <laughs> like it just see it just seems like an, an I I I can completely understand why most research focused on men because men at the very least sure you guys have some hormonal cycles but the shit that happens to women week to week over the course of a month is insane and that mm-hmm. kind of addition to your data analysis creates a confusion that just feels insurmountable because how do you control for all of these things in order to be able to say something true? Can you say something true or is it just true enough in a small enough circumstance that you can hang something on it and keep moving? I I think one way we make progress on that is figuring out like uh, useful ontologies, like uh, what turns out to be important and what doesn't. Um, and so, uh, like, I don't know much about the history of chemistry, but like, obviously, the uh, advent of the periodic table was like going from like, oh, we have all these different things. What are the important components of the things? Like, does it matter how they taste? Like, does it matter like how much they hurt when they get thrown at you? Like, there are, are there's an infinite space of things that we can say about these things. Um, what are the important things? Well, actually, if you lay them out this way by by this uh, aspect that they have, they turn out to have like that turns out to be useful for, for predicting some of their properties. Um, and like this is a huge problem in psychology where like we don't we don't know how to carve the world yet in a way that uh, that highlights the important things. Uh, like we don't exactly have uh, have a paradigm for like this is the thing that matters and these things don't matter. And I think that's what gives you some tractability on like, how can you run a study that answers this question is that you figure out, oh, we didn't need to measure these million things. It turns out that like these three things are pretty important. Um, And we're usually wrong about that. It turns out like, actually, we were missing thing number four, which interacts with all of them and it changes things. But we like ratchet up a little bit when we do that. Um, We think about there was a period in time in in medical history where after they invent, usually this happens like we invent some technology it allows us to measure something and we're like that's the thing that's the key to everything it's like we invent the thermometer and we're like temperature that's everything we <laughs> we gotta stick thermometers in people and then we're gonna figure out how disease works and the answer is like no it actually we didn't actually figure out how disease works but we still use thermometers like it does turn out to provide a useful piece of information um right like my wife has covid right now and like uh, administering a thermometer uh d- w- like helped us make the decision between like do we want a fever reducer or not um uh you know it didn't cure all disease but but at least got us there Mm -hmm. and like yeah it's i don't know it's not a huge amount of progress but it certainly is something um but those ontologies those paradigms are obviously hard to get uh because like you said before this this is the hardest question to answer is what matters uh it is slightly easier to answer what's true once we figured out whether it would matter or not uh that like even though you, you have to become Elizabeth Bick sometimes to like sift through all the data, it sometimes is at least possible. Uh, but the question of what's important, I think, is a is a question on the level of the mystical, right? Like it, be, because it does not submit itself to like algorithmic um, solution, uh, and that's why it takes a long time. Do you think that there's a clear issue with the way that social sciences have focused on what's important? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, in fact, I think now we're going through a revolution where, because we are so hurt by um, how many things turned out to not be true, that uh, we are obsessed with the idea of what's true and what's not true, forgetting that that's the second question that you should ask about any piece of research. The first question being, would it matter if it were true? And if the answer to that question is no, then you save yourself a lot of work because you don't need to figure out if it's true or not. Um but all of the reforms that we're going through, which a lot of them I think are really useful. It's not that they're bad, but but I think they are trying to pull a lever that only has so much give, which is let's make everything, let's make sure that everything's true, um, but that can end up with like, oh, there's a lot of true things that don't matter. Like if you really just wanted to make sure your results are replicable, you could just give people Stroop tasks until you know, the heat death of the universe. 
but we're pretty sure that yeah when you look look at a word that's written that it's the word blue but it's written in red it's harder to read um but uh if what you want to know if you, if you want to know something new and useful about the world like you cannot only ask um is it true like you have to ask another question first uh and none of the tools that we're developing like no oh no adjustments to our p-values no pre-registration no registered report um no uh meta-analysis is going to be able to answer the question of would this matter if it were true um like that has to be gotten at it some different way so what what are the important questions <laughs> uh i think the only important question is what is the important what are the important questions um I wish I had an answer to that. Um, I, I think one in psychology is um, what is a useful way about thinking about differences between people um, that I, I was trained as a social psychologist, um, but uh, there, there are also personality psychologists, but not many of them, because basically social psychology defeated personality psychology about a generation ago. Um, can, the, so can, I, can you elaborate on that? Yeah, the um, the most famous psychology studies that that uh, anyone could probably list, like the, the Milgram shock experiments or uh, the Stanford prison experiment, which obviously more more recently has, has been uh, uh, there's a lot of evidence that it, it's not what we thought it was right there. Uh, that was more fabricated anyway. But the most famous ones are uh, social psychology experiments showing the power of the situation. Um, the there aren't many famous personality psychology studies, um, maybe one being the marshmallow study. Um, but really, uh, and, and this I think is collapsing across a lot of history, but basically uh, social psychologists were, were able to show over and over again the power of the situation um, and cast into question, like how much do consistent traits about people matter if we can kind of put make them do whatever by whatever situation we put them in. Um, I don't know why, like, I don't know if funding dried up for personality psychologists or whatever, but I can certainly tell you today that, that like, if you go to the big conference, the Society of, of Personality and Social Psychology, it will be almost entirely social psychology. Like, the, the there aren't many personality psychologists left. And I think part of what that means is, like, the, the state of personality psychology is, is sort of trapped in time. I mean, obviously, this stuff still happens, um, but we're kind of stuck on this idea of the big five or models that are a little bit like it, maybe it's actually six things uh, or maybe it's fewer. And like this, we think captures everything that's meaningful about the difference between one person and another. And obviously it is, it is useful. It does turn out that like most of what you can ask people about themselves like correlates with one of these factors and that's why it sticks around. But to me, there is so, like, there's something that's so fertile in the fact that humans are so different from one another. People are weird, like really weird. In such a way that, that like having, you know, openness, conscientiousness, extroversion, uh, neuroticism and agreeableness to explain that way that like that it's not getting there. That is not enough to capture what makes one person different from another. And I think one reason we're stuck here is we were inheritors to what, what's called the lexical hypothesis, which was just this idea that like everything that must be important about human personality must be captured in words. That's obviously like we developed words to talk about it. Um, and so they went through the dictionaries and they pulled out every adjective uh, and asked people to rate themselves on it. And like, that's ultimately, that's how we got the big five. But I think there are important things about people that cannot be captured in words. Um, and we're never going to find them if we are stuck having people bubble things in uh, on a questionnaire. Um, and so I think there there is a huge uh, untapped mystery there um, as to like what, like not that we can necessarily have a periodic table for humans, but a step further in that direction. Like, what are the important differences between people that we have not done a good job capturing? Um, that's one of the questions. Um, but really the er question, the question above all questions is, is the, the very question of what matters. Uh, and I don't think many people are actually working that hard at it because mainly we are all trying to get jobs. <laughs> Well, I mean, in psychology, it seems like what matters is anything that helps people live better lives, right? At the end of the day, like, or I guess it's what allows governments to divine, devise economic systems that effectively nudge people into doing the things that the government wants them to do, right? Those seem to be the two bins. Well, also marketing, right? Isn't mm. a huge percentage of the graduate population from psychology going to work in Silicon Valley now? I remember hearing that. I don't know if that's true or not. 
Yes. Uh, I only know anecdotally that like the people who don't end up being professors, um, like marketing, um, I don't know anyone who went into, but, but like a common thing is like to go work for Facebook or Google um, on like doing something related to like user experience. Which is kind of terrifying because, and, and, okay, and, and I think that, I think that psychology is like a little bit of a terrifying field. <laughs> It just seems to me to be people who are mucking around in the depths of the human brain who are then leveraged by forces far greater than themselves to do stuff to people at a distance. Like the Ed Bernays, is it Ed Bernays? Uh, yeah, the Bernays story, right? He was, what was he, like Freud's nephew or something? Yeah. I mean, the idea that you could understand how people's brains worked and then use it to pull money out of their pockets, essentially. Yeah, have you seen uh, Century of the Self? No. So it's a fantastic movie. It's an Adam Curtis documentary. And it's... Gosh, how long is it? Is it like 10 hours? <laughs> <laughs> is it? I don't know. It's a multi-part series. It's like, I think yeah, it's a four-part so. series, and each part's two hours. And he basically traces the history of Ed Bernays, who was Freud's nephew, who was one of the first ad men who was able to really dig into what people wanted. And one of the stories that I, I remember well is the uh, acceptance of cigarette smoking in women. Ed Bernays is credited with being the guy who did that because he realized that there was a view of smoking being not ladylike. And Lucky Strike wanted to be able to expand their market. And so he realized that the women's liberation movement could be leveraged to get people, to get women to smoke. And so what he did is he got a bunch of models who were going to go to a suffragette protest. And then he planted a story with newspapers to say that the protest was that they were going to be lighting torches of liberty during the march. And all these models pulled out their packs of lucky strikes and they lit their torches of liberty. All the papers wrote about it and all of a sudden women smoked. And so that to me seems like a direct line of the history of psychology, which is that psychology comes up with stuff about how the brain works. And because we need it to be useful, what it's put to use to do is to manipulate people. Like the people who are working at Google and Facebook, they're not, they're not sitting around being like, man, how can we make sure that people are really healthy and well-rounded and touch grass a lot and, and feel really good? They're figuring out how to make people stick inside of these products for as long as humanly possible. Um, if, there, if there's any um, uh, solace to be taken, I think it's that we actually don't really know that much to do that much damage. <laughs> that like uh, that that like uh, if we re if if like what Edward Ace did really came out of scientific understanding, it would be replicable, right? Uh, but I think really it came out of an intuitive understanding. I think he maybe happened to be a psychologist, or maybe his training helped him. Um, but like, unlike knowing how to build a telescope where if you really know how to do it, you can instruct someone else on how to do it. And like, now everyone can have their own telescope. Um, obviously there, there's something missing here where it's not possible for anyone to pick up a book and then figure out how to make all women smoke or all women not smoke. Um, like, which suggests to me that like, we don't really have the scientific understanding. I think another example of this was like, uh, if you remember the Cambridge Analytica scandal, um, mm -hmm. uh, the, I, I think there was this fear that like, this system now knows everything about us and like it's going to be able to make us buy anything and even at the time i was pretty incredulous about that and more recent research has come out basically saying that like even when we have all this data we're just really we can't really use it to like push people that much um and like maybe it's non-zero but it is not mind control uh and like obviously thank goodness <laughs> that uh because if we invented mind control like that is that is the like psychological equivalent of the hydrogen bomb um but, but that's what's yeah. been the goal, right? That's like what the MK Ultras are. That's what all of the covert CIA programs are. That's what the Soviets were trying to do. Literally, every I mean, propaganda is as old as time. It's as old as empires and civilization. I think the true genius of Ed Bernays was that he was like, "Hey, we could use propaganda to sell stuff too." And, you know, I don't think it was a particularly scientific revelation necessarily. It was just something that he realized wasn't being put to use in the markets. Yeah, I'd agree with that. I guess what I, I'm trying to drive at is that 
there is a very, very clear utility to understanding the human mind. And like you said, it's the equivalent of a psychological hydrogen bomb. That once you have the ability to manipulate people's levers, then you have, you, you speed the world towards a more dystopian outcome. And so it feels like the most important and powerful questions right now in the field of psychology would be how to get out from under that, right? Because if it is a war for minds, which is a little bit dramatic, but honestly, after, the, after what happened the last couple of years, where everything from Trump to Hunter Biden's laptop to COVID to lockdowns to just trust the science to the vilification of people who wouldn't take a vaccine that made $37 billion in profit for a single company in a single year, like... Plague rats. Plague rats? They call them plague rats. Oh, really? God, that's terrifying. I didn't know that. Okay, so there's there's a lot of psychological warfare that happened over the course of the last year. And it doesn't matter where you sit on the side of, was it was the COVID response good or the COVID response bad? Is Trump good? Is Trump bad? I think that you can look and you can see that there's tons of psychological warfare. And the way that we tend to deal with it is we tend to talk about how we're going to fight misinformation and we're going to make sure that all of our information is good. And I think that that is maybe one of the stupidest and most misguided approaches to epistemic rigor rigor that I've ever come across because immediately you have, you know, who watches the watchers. We've all seen that Star Trek episode. And so it seems like, the greatest utility for the grassroots flourishing of humans is how to prevent yourself from being manipulated by the situations that you find yourself in constantly. And how do you become somebody who in a room full of people who are saying that this is a good thing, that you intuitively are like, I don't know about that. How do you become somebody who can say, I don't know about that? Somebody who can pass the Milgram test? Or the, uh, you know, the, uh, the, uh, the ash experiments? Yeah, yeah. I was just thinking of those. Right? Like, that's the, that's the... What's the ash experiment? It's like you get a bunch of people in a room together and only one person's the experimental subject, but there's oh, yeah, uh, yeah. all the other people. And then you show them two lines that are obviously different lengths and you ask them which one's the shorter one. And everybody who's a plant says that the longer one is the shorter mm. one. And if there's no dissenting voice, the experimental subject will almost always agree with everybody else in the room. But if there's one dissenting voice, then all of a sudden the rate at which your experimental subject will agree with what is obviously wrong plummets tremendously. And we seem to be going in a direction of we need to eliminate the voices that say things that we don't like. And that's pretty s scary. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, you pointed to, uh, if anything, one of the solutions that psychology has discovered um, or, or, or pieces of useful information, which is it is much easier to get people to conform when they're alone. Um, so both in the uh, ASH study, this is also true in one of the variants of the Milgram study, that if you have uh, basically a co-conspirator who says, like, I won't comply, um, then rates of non-compliance skyrocket. Um, uh, the, the other, I think this is only an, uh, an anecdotal data point from the Milgram experiments, but um, there was like a script of, uh, of responses that the experimenter would, would have when someone didn't want to comply. And uh, the one that was least effective was you must do this. Um, the people don't actually like being told specifically what to do. Um, I think the power of that situation is people actually feeling like they're doing something pro-social. Um, that like, it's rude to stop, not I, I really want someone to control me. And as soon as it feels like someone is trying to control me, people don't like that anymore. Mm -hmm. um, so like, I don't, I don't think that, uh, I don't know if there's many things like that. Like, uh, uh, sort of psychological counterterrorism, uh, or wh what's the opposite? Terrorism? I don't know. Uh, <laughs> what's the opposite fighting, of psychological? Yeah, yeah. I guess, I guess so. Um, I don't know if there's many things like that, but that also means, I think, fortunately, uh, that there aren't many things on the other side of that. That like there are still people who are good at controlling people's behavior. There's obviously a lot of coercion, um, but I think that's mainly built on people's intuitions and power less so than like their empirical understanding of psychology that we've gained from doing all this research over the years, which is both an indictment of that research, um, 
that like how do we know it's done anything if you can't use it for anything? Um, but uh, also like the, uh, the upside is um, we like haven't developed the hydrogen bomb, w which I think, by the way, like, I mean, if Oppenheimer is, is uh, even close to accurate history, it wasn't like there were a bunch of people sitting around being like, how could we build a hydrogen bomb? Like we should definitely do that. Like it was the necessity of war that made the government show up and go like, Hey, could you guys build this? Um, and so it's not that it necessarily flows from people answering questions of their own curiosity. It has to interact with people who want to establish a genemy over, over others, turning to these people to be like, hey, build us some tools. And what freaks me out over the course of the last year is that that was the centerpiece, right? The last three years of COVID stuff, it was obviously a centerpiece of how to get a concerted response in people to do the right thing, how to minimize dissent and how to prevent people from endangering the public. And on one hand, you look at it and you're like, well, that's obviously the most pro-social possible thing that you can do because I don't Did you pay attention to that like red pill versus blue pill thing that's been all over Twitter the last couple of days? No. There's this lady who posted a poll. Which was, okay, so you have to pick either the red pill or the blue pill. If less than 50% of people pick the blue pill, everybody dies. If you pick the red pill, you live, but everybody who picks the other pill dies. So anybody who does, so those are the two options, right? And Everybody who's a rationalist game theorist was like, obviously, you pick the red pill, you psychos. Why would you unnecessarily step into the human blender? And then everybody who had any ounce of pro-sociality was like, well, you obviously take the blue pill. Like, because if everybody takes the blue pill, nobody has to die. And well, not, even, not even everybody, just greater than 50%. And so it basically tore people apart and it's been this is just a fiasco where people are arguing about, you know, how stupid are you to take the blue pill? How stupid are you to take the red pill? But I think that it shows that there's this, there, there's a cleavage in the way that people think about things, which is pro-social versus libertarian, I guess, is probably the easiest way to, to pin that, right? I take care of myself. That's the only thing that matters. You guys are on your own. If you're smart enough and you know game theory well enough, you'll be able to do the thing that is good for good for the gander but i'm like climate change to me seems like the next frontier of this like we've moved past covid we have this other problem that's facing humans everybody has to agree about the way that we approach this i feel like the the, the pressure on people to do the pro social thing is going to ramp up and from a scientific standpoint i worry that all of the problems with peer review, all of the problems with generating consensus, all of the problems that we know go into industrial science that produce all these problems are now being brought to bear on this massive planetary question. And it's the perfect storm of a scientific question combining with a question of a global response that's necessary in order to prevent catastrophe and so everyone has to agree that this is the right thing to do because anyone who defects puts the entire game at risk and that to me feels like the razor's edge of something that can be very scary if we take it to be a given that that's how we use our understanding of the human mind because that's the hydrogen bomb moment. That's when all the governments are like, we need, we need to find ways to get people to do this thing that we know is the right thing to do because all of our science says that it's the right thing to do. And literally everyone who's funded is working on figuring out how that, how that can happen. Yeah. Um, it's a big problem. And I think like, I, I think we've put ourselves at a disadvantage trying to solve it by appealing to um expertise for so long that like the 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 refrain of trust science that like the idea uh that like you must accept this um th then like we end up embarrassing ourselves when it's like oh actually this part these things were fraudulent like oh, actually these don't replicate uh, but like trust but keep trusting us um i think we actually get greater trust through um 
through better accountability, through better transparency. That like, uh, like I trust the person who, um, who like asks for my trust and, uh, and like gives me the tools to know whether to trust them or not, rather than the person who insists that I must trust them. Mm-hmm. Um, so, uh, the, like still you have to do ho- like the homework, right? That that's the difficult part that like you can post the data online, but someone has to download it and run it to make sure that it works. Um, so like, and I'm not going to do that for everything, right? Like, I'm not going to vet all of climate science. Like, I can't do it. I don't have the expertise. And I don't have the skill. Um, but like, that is the way that uh, that like it establishes trust. Um, and when we get to the point where like we are now beyond dissent, um, I think is the is the point where like we actually preclude the possibility of getting to uh, to like a consensual agreement because you will always disqualify some portion of people who just don't like being told. Uh, that there is no dissent because it's like that's like that's not the way you're supposed to treat another human being um and i don't know maybe that means that like there actually is no way like we can't get everyone on board um uh unless we do it by gunpoint then i don't know maybe we all go down together uh because i because like i'm not on board for all getting together uh by gunpoint yeah I mean, that's, I I would agree with that. And that's kind of the unfortunate thing, right? Which is that when you see something that you know is right, you cannot push so hard that you go beyond the, I guess it's ethics, right? Because I feel like ethics is culture. The gunpoint is, is an ethical question. Like, should you do this at gunpoint? And I just, don't want to live in a world where that's the standard but that does mean that we all have to take on more risk because all of a sudden it's the question of well it might it might not work out we might not be able to solve the coordination problem and that's pretty unfortunate because you hope that psychology is enough to be able to help you solve the coordination problem and also to assure you that the solution that you found to the coordination problem is correct but i feel like and that's kind of the the burden that psychology carries but it can't possibly carry it because there's nothing that can carry it that's like it's almost beyond the realm of science to be able to to evaluate these things so objectively and in such a large way yeah i was gonna say it seems like the psychologists have inherited the former duties of the church to some extent like if you if you had spiritual issues, you might go and talk to your preacher at some point in the past. But now people are like, well, the scientists can take care of that. It's like, are they really cut out for that same task? Can can science really stand in for spiritual practice? Because I think that that's the hope in some sense for psychology is I'll I'll be psychologically healthy and therefore happy and behaving properly in the world and so forth. But I, I wonder if it's really even the proper venue for that. I, I actually just wonder if we can, if you look at all of the most successful economies, uh, we had this incredible economist on the show a couple weeks ago, Michael Hudson, and he was talking about the ancient civilizations and the way that the most strong economies functioned, the ones that lasted for hundreds and hundreds of years. And at the top of a lot of those, uh, at the top of all of those civilizations was a leader who was also the conduit to God, which is really interesting because it seems really scary at first. But when he breaks down what that means, it's like, well, they saw themselves as having responsibility for the cosmic order. That is the harmony of the citizens with the land, with the resources and with their enemies, essentially. And the the leader was beholden to that sort of cosmic mandate in a way that is completely absent in our political landscape today. It's like, there's no sense that that our president should be beholden to some cosmic order in any sense whatsoever. And it's like, I wonder, I wonder if we can get along without that in the long run, to some extent. And I, I'm not like advocating some like <laughs> the theocracy or something. I'm just <laughs> Let's like, do monarchy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, that's an interesting point too. Like we had a uh, we had we just had Curtis Yarvin on the show. Do you know do you know Curtis? No. Okay. So he he's this big libertarian advocate for you know, democracy is a failed experiment. And yeah, his solution is we need a monarchy, actually. And of course, it's going to be run by his buddies. And, you know, (laughs) but 
I, I do just wonder to the extent that people are thinking science is something to be believed in, to be trusted, to have faith in. Like it, it really takes this religious overtone to it. And, and I, I'm afraid that it's not really cut out for that role and that humans have a deep need for that, that spiritual guidance in a way that science just doesn't have the tools to handle. And I think that ties into what you were saying about the limitations of the big five. Yeah. Uh, also limitations of, of clinical psychology, right? Which, which isn't my field, but, um, uh, but I mean, speaking of replacing, you know, spiritualism with, with science, like the idea that if you feel like something is amiss in your life and you feel really bad, um, now, now, like generally the accepted idea is like, you're going to go to a person who is a scientific practitioner. Like they are supposed to be informed by evidence and, uh, and like, they're going to, to somehow talk to you or administer pills to you. And that will make you feel better. And like, obviously there's a lot of success there. And, and at the very least, like it really takes seriously the idea of seeing whether it's successful. Uh, and like, that is why we know, like how limited that success can be and why, uh, I mean, at least know a little bit about this, like why it seems like the effectiveness of the of these treatments um, is at least not increasing over time, even as we do more research and should understand people better. That like it is actually, I think, a difficult thing to beat um, the the idea that like rather than uh, treating someone's dissatisfaction with life uh, from uh, a sort of mystical point of view, like we're going to medicalize and and science science eyes it. Um, and like, I can see that, that like, we're trying to treat probably two different groups of people that the people who respond well to that, because like their problems did conform to more of our scientific understanding and the people who will not benefit from that. Like we're trying to fit them into the wrong thing that like the way out of this for them is something that's going to look way weirder and it's harder to, uh, to appreciate from someone who's treating them out of a CBT manual. I felt this, this way, that, like when I felt really bad, I wrote a post about this, I felt really bad during the pandemic. I went to a therapist and I, and I was like, treat me with the evidence base. Like I've taken a clinical psychology class. Like don't give me any of this psychodynamic nonsense. Like I want evidence-based stuff. And she was like, okay. And did a little bit of it, but, but it actually like the things that helped me way more were much weirder and more mystical. <laughs> and, um, and like I came out understanding why so many of the people who, who do these treatments like are ambivalent sometimes about like turning this into a scientific problem. Cause like, it, it, there is something about human experience that they don't understand. Um, and so even though they can get part of the way in for a lot of people, they can't get all the way in. I don't know. It's a difficult like thing to thread because you don't want to want to be like, actually you should just like trust in God and that will, and that will make your ADHD go away. And that will make you stop being schizophrenic. Cause like it won't. Um, <laughs> But there's a little bit of that that actually can help. And for uh, and like we do ourselves a disservice when we preclude that from as being a possibility. When you say when you contrast psychodynamic versus evidence based, what do you what do you mean by that? Uh, so like um, evidence based treatments being the ones that like are supposedly based on peer reviewed literature. Usually people think of CBT or cognitive behavioral therapy as like the, the forefront of this because it's been the most studied. Um, psychodynamic being more of like the inheritor of the Freudian tradition. Um, that, that word alone en encompasses a lot of different treatment modalities from like the neo-Freudian to, uh, to things that look a little bit more, um, evidence-based. But like when I was taking a clinical psych psychology class in undergrad, I remember there's like a part in, there's like a chapter in the book where it's like, yeah, th there are these group of practitioners who do not believe that we can scientifically study what they do. Uh, they're like, I see your studies and I think they are dumb because your questions don't capture what it's like to be a human, uh, or you don't look far enough into the future. You aren't measuring the things that matter. And at the time I was really skeptical of that. Um, and I think that deserves a fair amount of skepticism. Whenever someone is like, we're actually beyond evaluation. Like you can't study what we do. Like you should be extremely skeptical, but I think there is some truth to it. Um, that like, uh, I, I think they would only be disqualified if it turns out that like, yeah, you just give a CBT manual to someone and it just makes all of their uh, mental illnesses go away. Like that would be the time that's like, okay, yes, now you guys have to retire. Uh, but until that point, uh, and we're very far from that point, um, I think there's still a niche for them. What are the kind of interventions that they, that they argue for that are beyond uh, evidentiary? Yeah. 
yeah, here I'm, I'm uh, probably getting beyond my knowledge, but um, but I mean, these are people who who would think that like there's uh, something useful in talking to you about your dreams um, or uh, or or any kind of neo neo Freudian thing. Um, but really, any deviation from the idea that uh, there is like a standard of treatment um, that there's a manual that you follow when someone presents with a, a certain kind of mental disorder. Um, anyone who thinks that like actually the pr approach that you take is maybe going to be more eclectic. Um, it's I'm maybe going to deviate from these things um, is a person who is like edging toward this idea that uh, that like maybe the evidence isn't actually the only thing that we have to go on when we're trying to treat somebody. It's interesting that the individual has to moderate their encounters with these medical approaches too, to some extent, right? Like my dad will not like even take a Tylenol, like if he has a headache or something, because he's just like, He's like, no, it's like the pain's there for a reason. Like, it's going to tell me what to do or whatever. No, and he says, he also says, I don't take drugs. He doesn't take drugs too, right? He doesn't <laughs> believe in like modulating, <laughs> right? And it's an interesting thing too, because you're like, in some sense, you, you want to be able to take advantage of medicine, but you also don't, you also at the same time realize that it's not necessarily the cure. It's not going to solve the problem that's causing my headache either. And so it's this interesting dance you have to do. I mean, you can obviously it gets out of hand with people, especially in addiction issues, right? Like some people, you know, like I can drink a beer and I'm good, right? But there's a certain percentage of people who are like, it's got to be a totalizing experience. Like the beer is the whole event. It's like, I'm going to drink beer tonight. That's what I'm doing. And it's interesting how people kind of fall into those two camps and there's extremes at both sides, but it requires a lot of moderation um, in the modern landscape. Well, and it makes sense. You and I were talking about um, alcoholism and Ibogaine and AA as a way of getting people to stop drinking versus something that's like the spiritual work of figuring out why are you someone incapable of moderation and then actually fixing the problem that you have with not being able to moderate so that you're not an alcoholic for the rest of your life. You're somebody who's dealt with the fact that you can't moderate your behavior and learn to moderate it and so can have an occasional social drink. And I feel like so many, and we were talking about this too in the context of drugs or psychoactive substances. And so you take an SSRI and the SSRI is not a treatment that gets you to the point where you are able to now change something internally to yourself where if you stop taking the pill, you have fixed it. There's the uh, everything that, that sits on top of the SSRI is the thing that lets you do that. And the SSRI is basically just this thing that keeps your head above water for long enough for you to be able to do that. And I feel like that's kind of what you're... What yeah, there, you're I just read a really... I can't remember who it was by, but I read a really good critique of AA that was just like, hey, like, you guys are missing the point. Like, the point is not to get people to swear off of X, Y, or Z substance, because if they do that, even, they haven't actually addressed the underlying problem that caused them, and they'll, they're will they just going to get addicted to something else. Like, it could be healthy, maybe they'll get addicted to running or something, best case scenario, but they're going to replace it with something else because you haven't actually addressed that underlying obsession with something trying to fill some void do something block something out and if you and, and a much better approach is actually like figuring out how to construct moderation inside of people like how do you actually get people to understand that not it's not just alcohol it's what it's everything else too like you need to learn how to moderate your intake and your participation in these different substances or interactions or behaviors and uh yeah it was really a compelling argument yeah, I don't know if you've uh, heard of this guy, Carl Hart, who's a, a psychiatrist at, at Columbia. But yeah, so you might be familiar with, with this controversy caused a couple of years ago by being like, I take heroin sometimes, it's fine. Like yeah. the thing that causes you to be addicted is, is like something is bad in your life. Um, and like, it doesn't seem like a great idea to just be taking heroin uh, casually. But I think there is something reasonable in the idea that like no one gets addicted out of an abundance of things going well in their lives. Um, and like, and it actually does turn out sometimes that that like the thing that helps people turn their lives around is a mystical experience that to them is very real. And from the outside, that can look like, oh, we could have slotted anything in there. Like it could have been that you developed a good community or, you know, you discovered um, your intellectual love. Um, and like that might be true. But to them, the thing that was true was like 
they found God. Uh, they had a mystical experience and it made, and like, it made things made sense, sense to them and they stopped making the decision. And like, I don't know, I, I tried to straddle the line in between, like, we can understand some of that scientifically, but subjectively, we also have to respect the, like, that this person claims to have an experience that, like, is beyond scientific understanding. Uh, and like, our hope is to try to figure out, like, how do we help people find whatever that thing is uh, that stops making them want to take the drug? Um, uh, even if it's a thing that like doesn't submit very well to scientific scrutiny. I mean, the thing with the mystical experience is that it's not a prescription, right? You can't just like hand someone a bag of mushrooms and be like, you're going to get <laughs> over all your problems, right? It's like yeah. those things require a huge responsibility on the person undergoing the operation, whatever it is, uh, uh, the, the transformative experience. They have to go into it with the mindset, I'm going to fix this problem. And that's that's just not something that you can just inject people with and move them on down the line or give them a bottle of pills or something. There's a lot of hard work that goes into that in terms of your mindset that, you know, I am going to discover how to transform my psychology during this experience. And without that, it just doesn't seem to do anything at all, except maybe give someone some nightmares or something. Yeah. There's also like the bigger problem of, are we trying to help people solve their problems or are we trying to help people make peace with living with a wound because many of us grew up in the suburbs in america in the 90s and we're confronted with the fact that you're gonna go and you're gonna find a career and you're gonna do your job and that's going to be your life. You'll you'll eventually move out of the city. You'll get a house. You'll get some kids. You'll go to your job. You'll derive your meaning from family. And that's going to be the arc of what you do for the rest of your life. And you wake up at some point when you're 60 years old and you look around and you're like, man, I kind of turned into my parents. And for some people, that's going to be really good. For some people, it's going to be not very good. But there's a significant portion of the population that I think lives with the realization that their work kind of sucks, that they're being mildly exploited, not in the sense of mining cobalt in the Congo or, you know, being a slave in Mauritania or whatever, but just this kind of, like, low rent, I have to go to work for eight hours a day in order to be able to afford my apartment, but the work sucks and everybody sucks and I can make do with it but it's a wound that I live with and I'm anxious all the time and I'm depressed and you go to see a therapist and the therapist is like, well, this is how we're going to manage your unhappiness and your anxiety. And this is the case like during COVID, right? Everybody's locked down. The response is crazy. Everybody's isolated. Like out here, they closed the woods. You could not go into the woods, which f is insane. For a state that has four million people in it, the idea that you just couldn't go outside is kind of wild. And so obviously everybody was really freaked out. But what can a psychiatrist or a psychologist offer you except for ways to deal with the fact that shit's crazy? They're just like, well, you're just going to have to accept the fact that this is insane. And we can give you some tools, some breathing techniques, so that when things get really insane, you can... You just breathe right through it. You know, box breathing. Just love yourself. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, well, hold on a second. What if the solution is that the 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 disease that you feel with the world is because the options available to you suck and the system should be taken apart or the system should be reconstructed in order to prevent this. Like this makes me think of the you know Calhoun's Rat Park experiments? Mm -hmm. Or no, not Rat, Rat Utopia. Rat Park was different. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Where, again, you can criticize them, but the idea was that you create an environment that is sufficiently dense and sufficiently <sighs> unlike how the rats would live normally, that they start to behave in really strange and disturbing ways. And I'm like, are we in the Rat Utopia number 25? Sometimes it feels that way. And psychology can't give you a way 
out of that except with this manual that they hand you because the alternative is too weird and scary because then you're striking out on your own. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't think that even as we like hopefully get better at uh, like diagnosing and treating the things that make people feel really bad, that we will actually get better at doing that. That um, I don't even know that if that's a role that like a medical professional could have in your life, because I think it, it uh, like it is more mystical. I think it actually takes more rapport um, than one could have even in a therapeutic relationship. Right. Because like, I think it's, it's maybe even irresponsible for someone who you are like paying to provide you medical treatment to go like, Hey, have you thought about upending everything in your life? It wouldn't really make any difference to me other than maybe you lose your health insurance. I'm like, I don't see any more, but I've got a waiting list. that's like 20 people long anyway. So it doesn't really matter. Um, but like, if there's someone in your life who like will be affected by these things and they, and they have the whole context of who you are as a person, um, uh, that, that is one reason why I feel, uh, very lucky, uh, to like be married and to have this relationship with, with my wife where like, uh, like she is the person who could do that with me. Um, uh, and like actually come to an informed decision with someone who has some skin in the game. Um, you know, that's not to say that like the psychologist couldn't do anything of like fear, like, okay, is it, are these anxious thoughts that, that you would have w in whatever situation you're in? Um, or does this seem like this is really driven by something that's maybe changeable in the world i, I think one of the 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 deepest conund conundra is conundra the plural of conundrum What's one of the deepest like conundrums uh, <laughs> that we face is is like to what extent do i try to change my world versus the way i feel about it um and no, like anyone who purports that they can answer that question for you i think it's like they're probably probably trying to sell you something um because like that is a a difficult one um so i i don't know for me anyway i think like i wanted and this is what I, I'm, I'm doing is focusing on like there are like some key things that i am willing to spend the rest of my life working on changing them um but i can't do that for most things and i can do that for like two things uh and everything else i want to work on coming to terms with it being that that the way that it is and i certainly hope that the, that those remainder things are for other people the two things that they are working on uh and like power to them um but like we can't all work on everything um and so like for me like it's not, yeah sorry go ahead i was just gonna say i really like how marcus aurelius phrases this because he basically divides everything into stuff that you have power over and things that you don't have power over and it's crazy when you start inventorying your concerns and worries in the world and you start to realize like you're just bleeding all of this anxiety into things that you absolutely can't change and then when you narrow it down to the things that you actually can change, it's actually a pretty manageable set of problems. And there's something really empowering about that. But you really have to like completely reorient yourself to see it that way. Yeah. Um, yeah, this is why I, I stopped reading the news. Um, I, I wrote a post about this that like it felt like it was screwing with my ability to distinguish between those things. Um, mm. Because it felt like everything that was happening in the world is something that that like I should be personally involved in trying to fix, which is dumb. Like I can't do it. Like I'm not the right person. I don't have the skills. I'm, I'm not like positioned to do it. But there are problems. Like I am the person who has the skills and and the position and like the will and, and ability and interest to work on it. And like if I abdicate that position by like going, trying to, to trying to work on the thing that like everyone cares about right now, like I leave a vacuum. Like there's no one to step in after that. And like those realms might be pretty small, but I think the world is made up of all those small realms. Um, and like if we tend, if each person tended to that thing, uh, whatever that thing is for them, like I'm, I'm, I don't know, maybe a naive optimist, but I really think that that could work um, rather than there being like actually these five most important things that everyone must work on. And if you're not working on them, like you are abdicating responsibilities as a human. Um, like I'm glad that there are people who work on those things. Um, but that that ain't me. I don't know. Yeah. And how would you describe the two things that you think that you're cut out to fix? <laughs> um like one is uh the the work that I'm doing uh through the blog of like um uh both in terms of meta science of, of trying to uh like help diagnose like what are the barriers between like us and a world with more and better science in it um, and like knock down those barriers. 
um, and to like also walk down those avenues of uh, of trying to figure out like what would it look like to make progress in psychology um, and to try to do it. Um, that that I feel like is the public facing thing that 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 I can do. And then there, there there's like a private facing thing that like the most influence that we have is in in the in the our intimate relationships and like uh it's like being a, a good member of my family um and like a good friend to my friends um that that like i don't know i think about the like the world that you can change with someone that you have like a deep personal relationship and how you can like also ruin that world if you abdicate those responsibilities um and yeah so i i think those two things i think that's beautiful and i think that you're right that the world would be a lot better if that's what people focused on because it would be vibrant and it would be diverse and it would still be good and i hope that it catches on because i see you as part of a wave of people that are really turning towards this and putting it out there in the world of this kind of meta relationship to what they're good at where there's a ton of people that have been trained as PhDs, as as deep thinkers in certain disciplines. And because there's not enough space for everybody to just kind of go and start pulling the levers of, of the experimental machine, there's enough space for people to kind of walk around and look at it and to just kind of troubleshoot the future. Because the idea that the machine can work without it is absurd. Yeah. Um, I'm curious, what, what is it for, for you guys? Sorry, what, what was the, what's the question? Uh, um, what, what are those, those one or two things? Uh, or I mean, maybe you have 17 things, um, uh, of, of the, the place where you feel like that you have that combination of what you were good at and, uh, and what the world can use from you. I mean, I try to see my job. I'm essentially an artist. And so everything I do, the only purpose of it is to inspire, really. And so I try to take everything in and imagine how it could be better. And everything that I do kind of focuses on that. You know, whether I'm working on a piece of music or a podcast or a video or I'm teaching a lecture at the university, it's like, just like, how can I get people to see things in a new and like, I'm, I'm fundamentally progressive. I think things can always be better in every single discipline and domain. Every piece of music that I make, I know I can do it better. I can do the next one better, you know? And so I'm just like fundamentally driven by by that, mm. that which inspires, I suppose. And that's what I'm drawn to too, in terms of like the entire artistic world and the media landscape. I'm like, I w I'm always looking for stuff that's just gonna like blow my socks off and just like make me see things differently because I think that's kind of what ratchets the world forward. Hmm. What about you? Nasty. I love that about you, by the way. Like, oh. You're one of the, the people that I know that really does focus on finding ways to make the world better, not just f in terms of making yourself better, but in terms of finding ways to help people see it in a better way and in a more interesting way. Like Shiloh's really focused on atomics and he's pulled me into this project where basically at some point he had to teach a physics class and it was like, holy shit, we can't explain magnetism. And ever since then has just been in this unstoppable path towards being able to figure it out. And when he says that he's a musician, this is a man who every single month during grad school wrote composed, performed, and recorded a new song about some different feature of the life and the universe and everything. And it was just extraordinary because it was this it was this clockwork beat that as the entire world, as it does in grad school, tends to just kind of collapse in around you. He was just kind of like, no, this is this is the thing. And so it's very inspiring to watch and to live with. Oh. <laughs> But for me, I um, I really think that one of the biggest and most terrifying things that's happening right now is that the climate is changing and that I think that we have a deep misunderstanding about the dynamics that power it. I think we really, really might be wrong about the solutions that we're pushing unequivocally. And I think that the real solutions are much more complicated and much more terrifying because I think that it prevents us from being able to live life 
the way that we do right now. And so I think that the problem that I really want to be able to solve before I die is to figure out how to bring people together so that we can make the kinds of changes that everybody wants to see from many different directions, as opposed to saying we need to build machines that sequester carbon. And once we do that, we're going to fix everything to realize that that's not even that's not even going to scratch the surface. Like we're so fucked. <laughs> we're so fucked on every single level that we need people coming together and looking at the systems that are life support systems like agriculture and forestry and manufacturing, all the things that give us lives that are good to live. How do we maintain those structures while slowly piece by piece replacing them with things that are less disastrous? And so that's what I spend a lot of time thinking about. Because I think that I have the ability to talk to people and to bring people together and to find compromise that I think could be very useful for that. I mean, and then ultimately, and like we were saying at the beginning, <laughs> like if we, if we can just reiterate it, I mean, ultimately our goal here too is to actually be able to fund some extra academic institution because, you know, it's, we've used this analogy too many times on the show, but I'm going to do it again. When they were like replacing the Bay Bridge down in San Francisco where we spent a lot of our time, they didn't just knock it down and then build a new one. They built the new bridge first alongside the old failing bridge. And then they took down the old bridge. And I think that so much of the discourse, especially the political landscape, but also the academic discourse is so critical that it risks like shattering those institutions before there's a good plan in place to replace them. And that worries me very much. And so anything that I can, we can do to contribute to imagining a better what does a better state look like like yeah maybe our country is going to fall apart well, what it comes next like how come that's not the fundamental objective of all of these discussions the same with the academy yeah it sucks peer review sucks but like what are we going to do differently next time because otherwise we're just going to shake it apart and end up right back where we started a thousand years from now with the same problems the same corruptions so yeah let's uh let's i, I, I want to always imagine those new bridges you know get them built so they're ready to go as soon as the old thing comes apart. Yeah, I agree. And when you build a better bridge, like people want to walk across it of their own accord. Like you don't have to tell them to. Um, and I think when people imagine like how the world could be better, they think about like all the, these ways that we could make people act differently. Um, I think like those, uh, I don't know, I think it's both unethical, but it's also not sustainable um, that, uh, that like in academia or anywhere, I'd rather build the thing that people look at it and go, oh, I'd rather do that um then uh then the thing that they go oh i have to do that now so true mm -hmm. so true thousand percent true yeah do you have any closing thoughts uh, we've had plenty of thoughts i can't i can't imagine how to close them <laughs> <laughs> i i really appreciate the work that you do and i i hope we get the chance to to come together again down the line and see what you're thinking about and where your head is and how far along you are yeah, me too. I'm excited to see what you guys uh, do next. Fantastic. Feelings mutual. All right. Thank you, sir. Thank you for giving us your time. And um, yeah, we're uh, just maybe tell everybody your sub stack again really quick before we, before we take off. Oh, yeah. It's uh, experimental history. Experimental dash history. Got it. Cool. And then uh, is that the best place to, if people want to get in contact? Okay. Yep. Yeah. Cool. Um, that That's where I am. Thank you, Adam. Excellent. Thank you so much. Yeah, it's been a real pleasure. Thank you. To you. All right. Yeah, this is fun. Have a great rest of your day. Take care. Thank Bye, you. everybody.